thank you. That concludes general questions. We now turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. The First Minister, what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Running officer, we're used to watching budget U-turns after they've been given, but it's quite something to see one falling apart before it's even been published. Uh, the SNP government has been telling us for months that it will press ahead with its flagship plan to raid council budgets to pay for an attainment fund. Now, a few hours before the most important budget in this parliament's history, we read that the policy has been dumped. Isn't this a shambles, First Minister? First Minister. Well, I do concede that Tories know quite a lot about shambles. The Chamber doesn't have too long to wait until uh, Derek Mackay outlines the Scottish Government's budget. It is a budget that will deliver in full on the commitments we have made to extra investment in our schools to tackle the attainment gap and raise standards in our schools. And it's also a budget that will deliver fairness for local government services. Uh, overall, it's a budget that will make sure we invest in our economy, protect public services, and ensure fair treatment for uh, householders. Uh, so I think people across this chamber, uh, no matter how much they might like to moan about the budget, will have to welcome it when they hear it this afternoon. Ruth Davidson. It's a bit late to say wait till 2.30, First Minister. It's on the front pages of today's papers. And I don't know if the First Minister has taken the time to speak to anyone in COSLA who was actually at that meeting on Tuesday, because if she had, I am in no doubt whatsoever that they would confirm that this story in today's press is 100% true. But let me say here, if the SNP is going to dump this plan, then good, because local communities were right. They were absolutely right to say no to a national government wanting to snatch local funding. But here's the thing, here's the thing that many people will be asking today. Back in September, back in September, all of the opposition parties in this parliament sent a crystal clear message to the government telling it to ditch this proposal. And you'd think that something that put us and the Greens on the same side of the argument might have been a warning shot that there was a problem. And yet, this government ignores parliament. They ignored councils. And they've only climbed down now at the last minute because they've been told it won't work. Everybody else saw this coming, so why didn't they? First Minister. I thought, I thought the comedy turn at FMQs was usually reserved for Willie Rennie. It seems there's a, a new incumbent in that post today. Can I just check, presiding officer, that I've got Ruth Davidson's position right? I think what I am hearing her saying uh, today is this. Uh, to the Scottish Government. How dare you dump a plan that we absolutely demand that you dump? That appears to be Ruth Davidson's position today. When the budget is outlined in a couple of hours' time, uh, what Derek Mackay will outline is the absolute determination of this government to do what we promised we would do, invest more money in schools to raise standards, to help teachers and to close the attainment gap. And what the Chamber will also hear is a budget that delivers fairness for local government services. Uh, and I think when the Chamber does hear the budget, some of the, uh, the, the, the claims and accusations that we've been hearing in recent days from people across this Chamber will turn out to sound rather silly. Ruth Davidson. When she talks about claims and accusations linking local government funding to the attainment fund, does she mean those given by her deputy, who said, we secured a mandate at the recent election to raise an additional £100 million per year through our council tax reforms, specifically for raising educational attainment? Because that sounds pretty specific to me. But the real answer today, all this chaff aside, is that they thought that they could make councils pay for a Scottish government policy, and councils told them to take a running jump. So now we have to assume, despite their complaints and their long list of grievances, that Mr Mackay is able to find a spare £100 million down the back of his sofa to pay for the attainment fund himself. Unless, of course, the plan is to lop an extra £100 million off the Council's central government grant. So who's now paying for it? Is it councils or is it the government? First Minister. I'm I I'm confused at Ruth Davidson's line of questioning. I can't work out whether she wants us to do something or that she doesn't want us to do something. 
You know, we don't have long to wait to hear this budget being outlined. And I do think when we hear it being outlined, Ruth Davidson will look back on her line of questioning today, particularly that last uh, question, and conclude that it probably wasn't the most sensible uh, line of questioning to have pursued. This budget will deliver on the promise we made to get extra investment into schools. It will also deliver fairness for local government and it will respect local democracy and accountability. I would have thought each and every one uh, of these aspects of the budget will be things that people across this chamber uh, could welcome. I certainly hope that will be the case. The budget that Derek Mackay will outline in just over two hours' time is a budget I am extremely proud uh, to outline uh, for this government and I hope the entire chamber gets behind it. Ruth Davidson. It sounds an awful lot like instead of taking the money out of Council's front pocket, you're going to take it out of their hip pocket instead. Presiding officer, this morning's, this morning's headlines make it pretty clear that at the very moment we need a Scottish Government in control, instead we've got one that's distracted and utterly adrift. One which has, one which has allowed us to fall behind the rest of the UK in 25 out of 30 key economic indicators, which is deterring investment because of its threat of a second independence referendum, which tries to spin its way out of a rise in unemployment by pretending that the rise in unemployment isn't happening. President officer, the spin and the drift needs to end, because what we need right now, more than ever, is a government with a real focus on the economy, using the powers that this parliament now has to create new jobs, not deterring skilled workers with the highest taxes anywhere in the UK. So the First Minister is right about one thing. In two and a half hours' time, it is decision time. This government is either for keeping Scotland competitive so that we can grow the economy, or it's for taxing people more and putting a block on growth. The First Minister can't have it both ways, so which one is it? First Minister. You know, nobody watching this will have any idea what on earth Ruth Davidson is asking me right now. I don't think she knows. Totally confused and shambolic, but you always know when Ruth Davidson is drowning at First Minister's questions because she gets on to an independence <laughs> referendum. It's the, the straw that Ruth Davidson keeps clutching at. But I have to say it's a bit ironic that she talks about economic uncertainty. On the very day we see a story in the media, and she's very fond of it, citing stories in the media, that the UK government is being advised by its own EU ambassador that it will take 10 years to get a new deal with the EU in place. That's the economic uncertainty that's been created for businesses across this country. And it's entirely, it's entirely on the Tories' watch. But let's get back to the budget. I think when Ruth Davidson hears Derek Mackay's budget later on, she will look back uh, at the start of that long and winding and confused question she asked me uh, and realise how uh, misinformed and ill-informed it was. This is not about taking money from local services. This is about investing in local Absolutely. services, and that will be the hallmark of the budget this afternoon. But lastly, let me take it back to the core issue here and that is raising attainment in our schools. I have made absolutely clear the priority I attach to that, the Deputy First Minister attaches to that, and this entire government attaches to that. And when we see the budget this afternoon, what the Chamber will see and what Scotland will see is a budget that matches the investment to the ambition we have to make sure we raise standards in our schools and create a world-class education system. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Today is Budget Day. It's the day when the SNP will prove beyond doubt that they'd rather pass on Tory cuts than use the powers of this Parliament to do things differently. And nowhere is that clearer than in our education system. Because the last two weeks have exposed a decade of failure under the SNP. And even SNP councillors are now speaking out. In Dundee, they have said that the real problem in education is not who runs the school budget, it's the fact that the budgets are being cut. Does the First Minister agree with our SNP colleagues in Dundee? First Minister. We need to see increased investment in our schools. That's what the SNP pledged to deliver when we won the election in May. And that is exactly what Derek Mackay's budget will deliver this afternoon. 
President, I hope the First Minister has read this paper from our SNP colleagues in Dundee to the Scottish Government. It is pages and pages of a plea to stop the cuts to education. Because the truth is, there really is nothing progressive about the SNP. And we saw that yesterday, when the SNP once again voted with the Tories against a 50p top rate of tax for the richest 1%. And we see it in the state of our schools. Ten years of the SNP has led to falling standards, a, a shameful gap between the richest and the poorest children, and more than 4,000 fewer teachers. Whatever spin she puts on the budget this afternoon, does the First Minister really think it will reverse a decade of damage and cuts? First Minister. Well, of course, what we saw this week was an increase in teacher numbers. Uh, and part of that increase in teacher numbers, of course, was delivered as a direct result of the attainment fund set up by this government. What we also see just today is evidence of a narrowing of the attainment gap in terms of access to universities. And we have said that we are determined to go further in our universities and in our schools. That's why we had the data published this week uh, so that we can make sure we focus absolutely on raising standards, closing that gap and holding uh, government to account for that. Um, and in terms of our tax policies more generally, I seem to uh, recall yesterday at decision time, uh, Labour voted with the Tories against the position of this government. But we put our tax policies forward to the people of Scotland in the election. Now, I know that Kezia Dugdale doesn't like being reminded of the election in May because she led her party to the humil humiliation of coming third in that election. But in that election, we put forward fair, da balanced tax proposals and the people of Scotland endorsed them and we will deliver on them in our budget this afternoon. I know that the SNP government has a problem with its numeracy standards, but surely even the First Minister can see that an increase in 250 teachers in one year doesn't take away a loss of 4,000 yeah. over the last 10. And there are teachers, there are teachers and there are janitors and there are care workers uniting outside this chamber today against SNP cuts. Cuts which are damaging valued public services. Cuts which Nicola Sturgeon has spent her whole life saying she could stop if only she had the powers. Yeah. Well, now the First Minister has the powers and she is refusing to use them. So local services will face more cuts. Cuts which will hit everybody but hurt the most vulnerable. Labour will not vote for a budget which will inflict such pain on Scotland. The question is, why would the SNP... First Minister. Well, we won't, because what we will outline this afternoon is a budget that invests in public services. And I you know, absolutely believe that when we hear the budget this afternoon, not just uh, the questions we heard from Ruth Davidson, but some of the questions uh, we have heard from Kezia Dugdale are going to turn out to be completely unfounded, because what we will outline is a budget that supports our economy, protects public services, and makes sure we don't further punish uh, hard-pressed workers across the country. Uh, and the question, I think, when we hear the budget this afternoon uh, is not why this government would vote for it. We are proud of it. It's why anybody else in this chamber would not vote for it, because it is a fair budget and a good budget and I hope the entire chamber will get behind it. Now we have a couple of constituency supplementaries. The first from Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the First Minister aware of the level of concern about the proposals to remove inpatient beds from the Centre for Integrative Care, a change which, been de which has been deemed not to be a major one by the Scottish Health Council, much to the anger of patients and campaigners across Scotland? Will the First Minister explain to the Chamber what happened to the pledge made by the Health Secretary during the election that she would consider giving the CIC national funding? And will she and the Health Secretary agree to meet with campaigners before the meeting of the Health Board next week. First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary is always happy to meet with uh, campaigners and patients and does so on a regular basis. Uh, the decision about whether or not uh, this service change is deemed a major service change has been informed by the Scottish Health Council. We asked the Scottish Health Council to look at proposed service changes and give us advice as to whether they are major or not. The advice around the Centre for Integrative Care is that it is not a major service change proposal. All of the other uh, proposals coming from Greater Glasgow and Clyde have, of course, been deemed major service change proposals. These are the, uh, th this is the right way to make these decisions, uh, and that, uh, I think, is something that should be recognised across the Chamber. Of course, the Health Secretary will continue to engage with patients on this issue and on a range of other issues too. 
John Finney. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, on Sunday, over 500 people took to the beach at Nairn to complain about the transfer of oil between ships in the open seas of the Murray Firth. It's a plan that will create no jobs, but it will put at risk not just the marine environment, but coastal communities and the Highlands and Islands' most important industry, our tourist industry. In 2007, the Scottish Government vigorously opposed a plan like this for the Firth of Forth. Will you personally review the Scottish Government's position on this? and join the growing opposition to the significant potential threat. First Minister. Well, I absolutely understand the concerns that people are expressing. As John Finney will be aware, this is a matter reserved to the UK government. Uh, the Scottish Government has repeatedly requested devolution of this function since 2014, but currently we have no formal role in the process, uh, despite having devolved responsibility to protect the environment. I believe the Secretary of State for Transport and the UK government must take account of the advice previously given both by Scottish Natural Heritage and the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. So yes, I understand the concerns and we will continue to make these views known to the UK government and I'm sure the Environment Secretary would be happy to meet with John Finney to discuss the matter further. And Jackie Bailey. First Minister may be aware of my constituent, Angela MacDonald, who faced going to England or Northern Ireland due to a shortage of appropriate neonatal cots in the NHS in Scotland. She bypassed the Vale of Leaven maternity unit. There were no neonatal cots at the RAH in Paisley. She ended up in the Victoria Hospital in Fife without family or friends. Then she was told she might need to go to Newcastle or Belfast because they had a pressure on neonatal cots. This is simply unacceptable. Can I ask the First Minister why there were no suitable neonatal cots in all of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, why there appears to be a shortage of cots across Scotland, why the resources to buy equipment don't appear to be there, and if she agrees that this was unacceptable, what will she do now to stop women travelling hundreds of miles to have their babies? First Minister. Firstly, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the individual case. I have uh, read the media report of, of that, and the Health Secretary would be very happy to correspond uh, with Jackie Bailey about uh, the particular constituency case she raises. I will simply say I hope uh, her constituent and her baby are uh, doing well, and I, I wish them all the best. In terms of the more general issue Jackie Bailey raises around maternity and neonatal services, these are vitally important services in our country. That's why we commissioned the review and the uh, outcome of the review into maternity and neonatal services is due out early uh, next year and that will look across a range of these issues to make sure we have the right services and the right configuration of services in place across our country to make sure that mothers get the best possible care. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, the Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. It's, uh, it's not a new habit, but it is a bad habit of politicians to criticise an opponent for a policy we don't like and then criticise them again when it's reversed. So can I warmly welcome the change of direction that appears to be happening on the decision to raid local tax revenues to fund a national policy? Greens have been consistent in arguing that local taxation should be for local priorities and local decision making. Uh, and if this is going to be a change of direction, it will be a positive one. But if the reason for it is a, an inability to get agreement between central and local government, then surely there are two consequences. One for national government, for the Scottish government, that the ability to make Scotland-wide decisions on policy, on investment in services, has to be funded by national taxation powers. And that's exactly what those tax powers are for. And secondly, for local government, that they also need the flexibility, unhampered by central control, to make decisions about tax levels and tax rates at local level to meet local priorities. Because these are the people working hard in every community to deliver the services that we all depend on every day of our lives. First Minister. Well, obviously, I, I'm not going to comment in detail on the budget because uh, Derek Mackay will outline that shortly. Uh, but can I say uh, a number of things which I've said in response to other questions? And I hope uh, when the Chamber hears the budget this afternoon, there will be a recognition uh, that what I'm about to say is absolutely the heart of our budget. Uh, we have put together a budget that protects nationally funded 
public services, uh, a budget that will absolutely deliver on our commitment to get extra investment into schools uh, to help us raise standards and close the attainment gap, and a budget that seeks to protect local services and also respect uh, local democracy and accountability. Uh, these are three important principles, and I believe we will put forward a budget this afternoon that delivers on each and every one of them. Patrick Harvey. Yeah, the, the First Minister saying I'm not going to comment on the detail of the budget was a, a, a phrase we all expected to hear, and we understand that we'll, we'll hear the detail later. I was asking about the broad direction of travel. And if the First Minister is describing correctly a budget that will protect national services and protect local services from cuts, uh, then I'll look on that uh, uh, with an open mind. No party gained a majority yesterday in the chamber on the debate on taxation. No party, including the government, was able to convince a majority of the parliament of its own tax position. Now, some have described that as a stalemate, and it's in all of our interests, in all of our interests, to avoid that kind of stalemate when the budget itself comes for a vote or when the rate resolution, the tax rates, come to a vote. But it is significant that SNP, Green, Labour and Lib Dem MSPs were united yesterday in rejecting the Tory ideological demand that taxes should be no higher in Scotland. So if we want to avoid that kind of stalemate, all we need to decide is who is going to be paying more taxes, and we believe in the Green Benches that that should be people on the wealthier end of the income scale, not those who are low earners. So can the First Minister confirm that people like ourselves, MSPs, ministers uh, in the Scottish Government on high incomes will be paying more in tax next year than we did this year. First Minister. Well, I'll let Derek Mackay set out the details of the budget, but we put our tax policies to the electorate. We put our uh, national tax policies and we put our local tax policies to the electorate, uh, and we emerged by some considerable distance as the largest party in this chamber. Now, more broadly, I welcome the fact that Patrick Harvey says that he will uh, listen to the budget with an open mind, because I think he will find and hear plenty in the budget that he can agree with. And I would also say to him uh, that it is important that we seek to build progressive alliances in this chamber, and I am certainly very happy and very willing to do that. And I think what we will find this afternoon is that there are acres of common ground in this budget that we can all build on. So I look forward to working uh, with those across the chamber, or at least in certain parts of the chamber, uh, to try to build that progressive alliance that supports our economy, supports our public services, and makes sure we deliver fairness to people across this country who are already starting to pay the price of the higher inflation uh, imposed on us by the Tory Brexit obsession. These are the principles at the heart of our budget, and I hope everybody in the chamber will be able to support them. Some supplementaries. The first from Richard Lockhead. Will the First Minister join me in condemning Halfords, who want to charge one of my constituents in Speyside an astonishing £50 for delivering a pair of £5.99 car towels? To make matters worse, they've implied the high, high charges to put off customers in the north of Scotland from ordering. So, so much for the season of goodwill. But will the First Minister agree that as more and more rural residents buy online in the run-up to Christmas, that they should not be treated with this contempt or fleeced by greedy companies or discriminated against for living in the north of Scotland? And can I therefore ask if the First Minister and her colleagues in government will put as much pressure uh, as possible on to the UK government to sort this out once and for all? First Minister. Richard Lockhead raises an important issue, and yes, we will continue to apply pressure to the UK government to take action. Uh, the level of charge that Richard Lockhead has outlined today is shocking. It's certainly based on what he has said today. Uh, it seems vastly out of proportion. Um, and, you know, yes, I am in full agreement that excessive charging for parcel deliveries is unacceptable, particularly uh, when we know that more and more customers are taking advantage of the benefits of shopping online. So that's why we played an active role in developing a statement of principles for delivery charging, which reputed companies should adhere to. However, as Richard Lockhead has uh, alluded to, the UK government has the power and indeed I think the obligation to prevent this kind of situation from arising and we will continue to press them to do uh, much better by our rural citizens than they do right now. 
Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since February of this year, the Scottish Prison Service, on behalf of Scottish Ministers, has had the power to release prisoners up to two days early so they can access services in the community, a move supported by parties across this chamber. The Scottish Government's policy memorandum at the time stated that some 4,000 prisoners a year are released on a Friday and that release on the days preceding weekends is, and I quote, consistently raised as a key barrier to accessing services. I've now found that in the 10 months since that provision was made available, it's only been used for one prisoner. What's the First Minister's assessment of the usage of this power? First Minister. An issue that certainly sounds as if uh, it's one we should look into further. I'm happy to look into it further. I don't have the detail uh, of it in front of me just now. Uh, but the, the reason for the policy that he has outlined is to help uh, prisoners before their release reintegrate and access services in the community. And that's a very important part of trying to reduce reoffending. So I'll give an undertaking uh, to the member today to look into this and to have the Justice <coughs> Secretary uh, write to him with the detail he's requesting. Anna Sauer. Presiding officer. Humanity is dying before our eyes and the world looks on helpless. Uh, looking at the scenes from Aleppo, I feel angry, broken, helpless and lost. Angry that this can happen in our world. Broken because I can only imagine if that was my children uh, staying awake at night because of the sound of gunfire and explosions or if it was my boys whose only hope in life was to stay alive. Helpless because I don't know what I or anybody else in this chamber can do to actually make a meaningful difference. And lost because every option I think of can only mean more bloodshed and violence. We need to do something, but I honestly don't know what that something is. I know warm words won't save a single life in Aleppo, but I hope all of us in this chamber can encourage people across Scotland to take part in the humanitarian response in Syria and also send a strong message of solidarity, humanity and peace to every man, woman and child struggling in Aleppo. First Minister. Can I uh, thoroughly endorse uh, Anas Sarwar's comments and also share the, the sentiments that he has expressed to the Chamber today? Um, I think each and every one of us finds the scenes that we are witnessing on our television screens nightly at the moment from Aleppo to be heartbreaking and deeply, deeply distressing. And it is very difficult in these circumstances for any of us to say exactly what can and should be done to resolve the situation. But we do know that the world cannot, uh, on this occasion, as it has done so often in the past, continue uh, to stand back while uh, the scenes of, of slaughter and destruction uh, happen before our very eyes. Uh, there are things I, I think we should be supporting, uh, more of a humanitarian intervention. I think the uh, suggestion of humanitarian airdrops, for example, is one that should be further uh, discussed. Uh, evacuation of uh, the, the wounded. Uh, for example, there is Red Cross evacuation happening uh, as we speak right now, and I think we should be supporting uh, more of that. There should absolutely be a determination to hold uh, anyone who is guilty of what would be uh, war crimes to account for their behaviour, uh, and the international community, I think, must unite behind that. But I would endorse Anas Sarwar's uh, plea that all of us uh, should bear the humanitarian crisis in mind and seek to do what we can do as individuals to help with that humanitarian effort. Can I say um, just uh, more widely, and uh, what I'm about to say does not in any way take away from the horror that we are witnessing in Aleppo, but this time last week, uh, after uh, First Minister's questions, I uh, went to visit a group of Syrian refugees who arrived in Edinburgh at uh, round about this time last year. And what I saw there was a, a number of people still uh, suffering trauma and real anxiety and concern about relatives who are in other countries or in some cases still in Syria. Uh, but I also witnessed there what can happen when as a society we come together and are determined to act in a humanitarian way, giving refuge, giving a home to people who need it. Um, so let's hope uh, today, as we hope on all days, but particularly as we get so close to Christmas, that uh, we can see a future where the, the love based on that humanitarian instinct can overcome the horror that we witness all too often. And Stuart McMillan. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm sure that, that we can all welcome the 253 uh, full-time equivalent teachers in Scotland uh, announced this week, uh, many of them directly funded by uh, the Scottish Government. But as Parliament learns with the Budget later on today, does this not reinforce uh, the message uh, that all politicians, whether in this chamber or in local government, should actually get behind, fully get behind, the Attainment Scotland Fund? First Minister. Yeah, I hope the entire chamber will get behind the Attainment Scotland Fund, indeed the Attainment Challenge, uh, which is focused on raising attainment in our schools. I certainly have been uh, very clear about the priority I attach as First Minister to the work that it supports. Um, the teacher number figures that were published earlier this week did show an increase in teacher numbers, uh, but it is quite important, I think, as part of that increase, uh, I think 160 out of the 253 extra teachers were teachers that were funded directly through the attainment uh, fund. Now, uh, that's a relatively small number because the fund is still in its early stages, but it is a demonstration, I think, of the power of that kind of directed and targeted resource, uh, and the budget this afternoon will set out our plans to make sure that that kind of approach continues. Question number four, Mary Evans. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the oil and gas industry in light of recovering oil prices. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has worked closely with the oil and gas industry through the work of the Energy Jobs Task Force to overcome the challenges it has faced as a result of the downturn. Uh, while oil, oil prices have recently risen slightly, we are under no illusion about the challenges the sector continues to face. Uh, of course, the UK Government holds the main levers to support the sector, uh, and we were disappointed that they provided nothing new in terms of support in the autumn statement. Uh, we remain committed to supporting the sector, and of course, with up to 20 billion barrels of oil still to be recovered from the North Sea, it's clear that with the right investment and the right interventions now, the industry can and will have a bright future. Mary Evans. I thank the First Minister for that response. Yesterday I received an update from BP, as I'm sure other North East MSPs did, in which BP CEO Bob Dudley is quoted as saying, the myth that the North Sea is finished is absolutely that. There's a demonstration of new activity and new big fields coming on stream. There's real economic activity that will support thousands of jobs, and there is an active exploration programme that could create something really new and exciting. Given that the Westminster government have completely failed to support the oil and gas sector and the northeast of Scotland's economy, can the First Minister outline what work the Scottish Government is doing to maximise investment in this vital sector and to encourage this exploration? First Minister. Well, the Finance Secretary wrote to the Chancellor in advance of the autumn statement outlining further action the Treasury could take to support the sector at this time, including vital measures to stimulate exploration. Uh, I think it is disappointing that the Chancellor chose not to act, and I hope we will see uh, further action from the UK Government over the months to come on exploration, but also around uh, the operation of decommissioning tax relief, which is also very important in terms of the stage uh, the North Sea sector is at right now. Uh, the Scottish Government will continue to do all we can to support the industry. The task force that I mentioned remains focused on supporting those who are affected today, but also at the same time looking to the future to lay foundations for a vibrant industry for decades to come. The £12 million transition training fund uh, established by the Scottish Government has been very successful, supporting so far over 1,200 people who have been made redundant to retrain and upskill. So these are real tangible efforts to support workers in the industry at this time. And of course, uh, through the city deal uh, with the UK Government, although the Scottish Government is investing more in terms of infrastructure, uh, we're supporting Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire to make sure they've got the infrastructure they need to compete in the future. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. C can I quote directly to the First Minister what Oil & Gas UK said in response to the autumn statement? Deirdre Meekie, Chief Executive, said this. We are pleased to hear the Chancellor recommit to HM Treasury's driving investment plan today. This sends a strong signal to investors that the government recognises that the UK oil and gas tax regime needs to be predictable and internationally competitive. Presiding Officer, when the industry is so positive about the UK government action, why can't the First Minister be? First Minister. Of course, the industry, the industry in oil and gas UK, of course, will speak for itself, but the industry have been calling, have been calling, I, 
I attended uh, a meeting a few months back in Aberdeen with Oil and Gas UK and we discussed some of the particular issues that I've been talking about today, further support for exploration and in particular how decommissioning tax relief is dealt with uh, to make sure that it can also support new entrants uh, into the sector. These are important practical uh, measures. I recognise some of the earlier steps that the UK Government took around investment, for example, but I think all of us all of us should say there is more that needs to be done and we should unite in order to ask the UK government to do it. I think that's a perfectly reasonable approach. But in the meantime, as First Minister, I should make sure that we're fulfilling our obligations as the Scottish government to support uh, retraining, to support upskilling, to support efforts that ensure when the industry does recover, as it will, uh, we still have the skills in the northeast of Scotland uh, to ensure that it can flourish. So if we work together, uh, as I think it would be a good thing to do on this, uh, as indeed uh, it would be on, on other things as well, then we can make sure that this vital Scottish industry has the support it needs and can have a very bright future indeed. Yeah. Question number five, Peter Chapman. Presiding officer, uh, to ask the First Minister, in light of recently reported issues, what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that farmers can have confidence in the National Basic Payment Support Scheme? First Minister. It's clear that it is important to learn lessons from all recently reported issues uh, to give farmers the confidence they need in the CAP payment scheme. Uh, we've already accepted all of Audit Scotland recommendations and a range of internal actions are being undertaken by officials to implement internal checking processes. Uh, but it is crucial uh, that this does not risk delivery to farmers and crofters and I would hope that all members would agree that the thing we can do to give farmers most confidence in the 2016 scheme is to deliver it by the end of June, the timescale set out by the Rural Economy Secretary. That is what he, uh, me and the entire uh, government is focused on achieving. Peter Chapman. I am grateful to the First Minister for that answer. Last week, Scotland's rural community saw her government overpay loans to 166 farmers to a total of £746,000. And we also saw a foul up with the Beef Efficiency Scheme's data protection, which has led to a breach with thousands of email addresses accidentally released all on top of a dismal record on getting the CAP payments to farmers and crofters. Will she commit to delivering this year's balance of the CAP payments as soon as possible and at the very latest by June of next year? First Minister. Well, yes, that's what I just said we were absolutely focused on doing. In terms of the data protection issue, that's a serious matter. It was a human error uh, within the government and appropriate action uh, will, of course, be taken to ensure that those errors uh, do not happen in the future. In terms of the overpayment issue that was identified on the day of uh, the issue of the loans, affected businesses were contacted the next day, uh, an apology was issued and discussions have taken place about how that money will be repaid. Prompt action was taken to alert customers about the overpayment and agree repayment. But, you know, on the more general issue, the issue I think uh, farmers and crofters are, of course, concerned about over 12,500 farmers and crofters have now received a nationally funded loan. Uh, the total uh, loans uh, amount to £256 million, uh, and that is getting money into the pockets of farmers where it needs to be. And Fergus Ewan has been very clear that we are absolutely determined uh, that the scheme will be delivered in full by the deadline of June next year, and I hope uh, the member will get behind him and the government as we seek to ensure that that is the case. Mike Rumbles. Almost a third of farm businesses are so confident about the Scottish Government's loan scheme, which closed yesterday, that they're not taking it up. This means that over £200 million that was due to be spent in the rural economy this month, because it's December every year, that money is sitting in the Scottish Government's bank account. Does the First Minister, and the First Minister is laughing at this, but does she not understand that the continued failure to deliver farm entitlements, because that's what they are, on time is damaging our whole rural economy. First Minister. Well, we're absolutely focused on making sure that we support the rural economy. In terms of Mike Rumble's questions about the loan scheme, <clears throat> we made a loan scheme available. It was the right thing to do, and I think it was widely supported, not just across this chamber, uh, but by the industry as well. 
With the greatest respect to Mike Rumbles, I cannot force farmers to agree to take a loan. The offer was made. Uh, many farmers have taken that up, and as I've just said, uh, 12,500 uh, farmers and crofters have received a nationally funded loan. If some farmers and crofters opt not to take that loan, that is their decision, and it's a decision that, as the government, we have to respect. Now, in terms of the payment of the overall uh, scheme, in terms of the uh, last year's scheme, of course, 99% uh, of payments ha have been made there, and we are absolutely focused on making sure we learn the lessons from that so that payments are made by the June deadline that we've been spoken about. So uh, I have repeatedly, uh, in previous occasions, and I have no hesitation in doing so again, apologising to farmers and to the rural economy uh, for the mistakes uh, that were made and the delays that were encountered in the 2015 scheme. We are determined to learn lessons, to put it right and ensure that we meet the deadline next year, and that's what we will do. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the figures released by the Care Inspectorate that show 70% of four-year-olds were recorded as receiving funded childcare. First well, I think it's very important to note, and I hope uh, Mr Johnson will note it, that the 70% uh, he has uh, derived from the Care Inspectorate's figure is based on a trial statistic uh, on numbers of funded four-year-olds. I think the Care Inspectorate has said, itself has said that these are trial statistics and may well be incomplete. In fact, its own uh, report clearly indicates that the data has been collected for the first time and states, and I'm quoting here, there are some uncertainties regarding the data quality. I and the Care Inspector would therefore urge caution in drawing conclusions from these trial statistics. Uh, the member may wish to note that the latest statistics published by the Scottish Government this week, which are validated and quality assured statistics, showed levels of uptake for four-year-olds remain at near universal levels. Daniel Johnson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. But fair funding for our kids have been telling the government for two years that the way the government measures childcare is wrong and that children are missing out. Indeed, it is ludicrous to rely on statistics that show rates well over 100% in some areas. The care inspectorate figures confirm how misleading the government's figures are. If we can't have confidence in the government's figures on the uptake of 600 hours, how can we have confidence that we're on track to deliver double that especially when the government's blueprint on childcare has already been delayed. Can I, First Minister. I, I'm very happy to ask the, the Minister uh, for Childcare to write to the member to set out some of the detail of this, because I think it is important that people understand it. The, the figure uh, from the Scottish Government's figures, and these are quality assured and validated figures of 98% for four-year-olds, we have recognised uh, and partly recognised uh, as a consequence of our discussions with Fair Funding for Our Kids that there will be some duplication in that. But taking account of that duplication, uh, there is confidence in the figure uh, that it will be over 95% of four-year-olds registered for their entitlement of childcare. Now, that is getting very close to universal levels. Now, I have equally uh, conceded in this chamber uh, many times in the past that we must do more to improve the flexibility of the provision we're offering, and there is work well underway with local councils to do exactly that and of course we're now focused and this will also be reflected in our budget this afternoon on doubling the provision over the lifetime of this parliament because actually it's the doubling of the provision that will deal with some of the inflexibilities that parents understandably find difficult so this is a an absolutely vital policy, vital for uh, the good of our young people, vital for parents helping them get into work, and one that I'm going to be very proud uh, on behalf of this government to see implemented over the life of this parliament. And finally, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, can the first minister outline how much money the Scottish government has invested in early learning and childcare, and how much local authorities have spent? And does she agree with me that it is the height of hypocrisy for Labour politicians to come to this chamber bemoaning ELC funding when Labour councils like Fife have taken Scottish Government funding and run? First Minister. Well, one, thing, one thing we know, and we know it from the financial review that was carried out, is that the expansion in childcare to 600 hours uh, has been fully funded. Uh, local authorities have been provided with 500 
million pounds for that since 2014. Uh, and of course, we are committed to further funding to support the doubling of provision that I've already spoken about in the draft budget. We'll touch on this later today. The financial review, though, also highlighted the estimated significant underspend in the funding given to local authorities to support the expansion to 600 hours. Uh, I do expect local authorities to spend the funding we make available to them to provide the hours, the flexibility and the choice that parents and children have a right to expect. Uh, and I do also uh, expect to see clear progress from authorities uh, with low levels of registrations but which have failed to make full use of their funding. These are important issues. It's vital that the Scottish Government funds our commitments but it's then vital that local authorities use that funding to deliver the commitments. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Oh. Point of order. Where is he? Patrick Point of order, Patrick Harvey. Officer, section three of our code of conduct covers declaration of interests. It covers written declarations of interest, but it also makes clear that spoken declarations of interest in the chamber are required on certain occasions. It states a member must declare an interest when speaking or intervening in a debate where that interest relates to the subject being debated. It later says if the member wishes to take part in the meeting in any way other than simply attending or voting, they must make an oral declaration. Can I ask for your guidance? Does this section cover farm payments? And will you, re look, at the re and will you look at the official report of today's uh, FMQs and uh, consider whether it's been complied with? Yeah, thank you. Very good. I will say... Uh, thank you very much. I, I will look into the matter that Mr Harvey raises. Uh, Lee MacArthur. While you're investigating that point of order, could you also um, seek uh, clarification as to whether uh, PLOs who ask questions would de declare that interest as well? Because I think that has happened in this, in this occasion. I can, yes. I can, I can do it. Second. Hang on. Sorry. Chamber, order, order. It's not lunchtime yet. Uh, just on the second point of order, uh, I can tell you that uh, the First Minister's uh, PLOs need to declare themselves, but the, the PLOs who have a, a link with the Cabinet Secretary do not. And that's the arrangement that we've come to. So that, even though it's a subject. And that concludes, that concludes question time. We move on to members' business in the name of Gordon Lindhurst. Can I ask members please to move quietly.